Okay, hello everyone, good morning, um, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, my name is Graham Coleman, I'm a Senior Accessibility Consultant at uh, the PASIEL Group, and I have Ian Pouncey with me as uh, the other moderator for this session, and we're delighted to present a talk today by uh, David uh, Swallow from the uh, University of I York. Pouncey with and, me, um, and, uh, the other moderator. Oops, we've got a bit of echo there. I'd like to, to present a talk today by uh, David uh, yeah. Swallow. And so what we're going to, to do now is uh, we'll shortly hand over to um, uh, David, but if you've got any questions for, for David during the session, uh, please ask them, ask them on Twitter uh, using the hashtag ID, ID24. Um, but apart from that, it's, it's, it's basically... Well, and also we've got uh, captions that are linked to from the, the YouTube description as well. So um, I think that's everything I need to say. So uh, basically over to, to David, if you just start sharing your screen whenever you're ready. Okay, great. Thanks, Graham. Okay, is that working? Yeah, okay. Okay, so uh, my name, as Graham said, is uh, David Swallow, um, and I'm a researcher in uh, human computer interaction at the University of York. And for almost the last decade, um, I've been working on various research projects in which I uh, design and develop and evaluate um, usable and accessible um, interactive technologies. And we do sort of various work in, in the research group, but um, we're particularly interested in um, web accessibility and, and design for people uh, with disabilities uh, and also older adults. Um, prior to this, I used to be uh, a web developer for a, a small software company. And here I'm responsible for designing and, and developing websites for clients in the uh, property business, uh, state agents and um, realtors. Um, who were a delightful bunch of people. Um, when I think back, this is where I first came across the, the concept of web accessibility and so I did the rest of banging the drum about it then. Um, and then this background in, in web development has, has stuck with me and it's influenced my, my current research. And for the last um, six years, uh, I've been doing a, a part-time PhD uh, in computer science. And I'm investigating why professional web developers are struggling to build accessible websites uh, and, and how we can integrate accessible web development practices into their uh, existing workflows. So this sort of has drawn upon my experience both as a researcher and a, a web developer. So I thought I'd just give you an overview really of, of my research and, uh, and what I've, I've been doing. Um, it's not going to be a very technical, very practical talk, um, but there's, you know, there's going to be plenty of that in, in today's session. So uh, it should be particularly interested, interesting to um, web developers and practitioners, I uh, hope, um, but, but hopefully it'll be of interest to everyone. Um, so it's in two parts. The first is a sort of bit of background um, to my research uh, and then what I've, I've actually been doing. I should point out this: the research is still... Um, ongoing. I'm, I'm currently uh, writing it up, so I would really value any any feedback or any any questions uh, you might have. Okay, so enough about me. Oh, there we go. That was my brief intro. Um, so I'm going to start this off um, by looking at what what has been done about web accessibility. Um, so obviously, uh, web accessibility has always been a challenge, and there's been uh, numerous attempts to um, tackle this challenge. I'm just going to provide a very, very brief potted history of that. Um, so it all starts with the the W3C, the, the World Wide Web Consortium, uh, the web's governing body, the main international uh, standards organisation for the web in 1994. Uh, three years later, uh, in '97, um, the W3C formed the the Y, uh, the WAI, the um, Web Accessibility Initiative, to try and improve the accessibility of the web for people with disabilities. 
Two years after that, there's the first version of, of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, WCAG, they were published. Um, and at a similar time, a year earlier, in 98, um, Section 508 was published, and that, that required US federal agencies to make their electronic and information technology uh, accessible to people with disabilities. Um, uh, and Section 508 was, was legally enforceable in the US, so that, that became an important benchmark. Um, now, with WCAG being pretty much first off the block, it was incorporated into lots of uh, legal documents, um, lo uh, local standards, specific guidelines, and became the, 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 the de facto standard uh, for, for web accessibility guidelines. Um, there were numerous criticisms at the time. It, it, it sort of soon became out of step with technologies. It was it was too focused on um, proprietary technologies, and it hadn't been uh, validated with actual users. So in December two thousand and eight, um, almost a decade later, uh, WCAG two was published, and this was a lot more uh, up to date. Um, however, I, I think it's fair to say it's quite difficult to to interpret. Um, and to address that problem of being too technology specific, it attempts to be technology agnostic, and as a result, it can be more general in places, and but very specific in others. And it's quite difficult for anyone without a, a good grounding in web accessibility uh, to understand. Um, other things in 2010, the UK Equality Act came into force um, in England, Scotland, and Wales made it illegal to discriminate against people with disabilities. So anyone providing a, uh, a service, um, public and private and, uh, and voluntary service, um, so if anyone with a disability couldn't in, uh, access information on a website, then it could be seen as, as discrimination. And similarly, in the US, it was a 2011 update to the Americans with Disabilities Act that required all businesses in the, U, uh, the US serving the public, whether the storefront or the, the web, uh, to uh, meet the ADA accessibility guidelines. Um, so over the last um, 15, 16, 17 years, there have been various initiatives to support, um, to encourage, uh, and, and, and sometimes to legally uh, compel web developers to improve uh, the accessibility of websites for disabled people. Has it made much of a difference, though? Um, so in parallel to these, these um, initiatives, there have been lots of um, studies that sort of try and attempt to take a, uh, a measure of the current state of, of web accessibility, and they usually pick a selection of Websites, often the most popular websites, but sometimes it's a particular sector like the government or libraries or something like that. And then they evaluate the websites uh, using various methods, automatic, manual testing, sometimes user testing, um, and often following um, various guidelines, usually working. And then they pre pre uh, present a, a benchmark of web accessibility. So just quickly I'll run through a few of these. Um, in 2000, Sullivan and Matson looked at the accessibility levels in 50 of the web's most popular sites, and only 18% of, of those were accessible. Uh, Stowers, Stowers, 2002, looked at the accessibility of 148 US federal websites, and only 13.5% were accessible. Um, the Disability Rights Commission, uh, in 2004, uh, they commissioned a, a, a landmark investigation of a thousand UK websites from government, business, e-commerce, entertainment, um, and they they did automatic testing, manual testing, and user testing. And 81% of the of the home pages failed to achieve the the lowest level of accessibility compliance. Um, 2005, the UK Cabinet Office published a report on the accessibility of government online services across the European Union, and only 3% of the 436 public service websites achieved WCAG 1 level A. None of them uh, achieved level uh, AA. Uh, 
Um, skipping over a few. Ola Leary, oh, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, uh, and Lazar. Um, they uh, looked at the accessibility of 100 US federal home pages to determine their compliance with Section 508, and over 90% uh, had um, serious accessibility violations. So I hope I haven't labored that point too much, but yeah, this is this is only the, 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 the tip of the iceberg. I'm, I'm currently sort of putting together a, a systematic review of, of the web accessibility evaluation literature from, from uh, the last 15 years or so. Um, which is over over 300 papers so far, just to try and show a clearer pattern of, of what is happen, happening. Um, I'm still analysing these papers, but the early indications suggest that despite the introduction of various guidelines uh, over the last decade and these growing legal requirements to implement them, the accessibility of websites um, is not getting any better, uh, and in certain cases, it's it's actually getting worse. Okay, so whose whose fault is this? Where does the responsibility lie? So um, there are obviously various stakeholders involved in creating and maintaining accessible websites. You might have the the, the, the person or the organisation that commissioned the website, you've got the content providers, um, web designers who might provide you know the, the uh, graphical the style, stylistic input. Um, web accessibility experts, uh, operating system, browser and assistive technology providers, web and uh, accessibility standards groups, and possibly more. But um, I would argue that the, the stakeholder group with the greatest influence on whether a website is accessible or not is uh, web developers, because to a large extent they they sort of mediate all this and they integrate everyone's in inputs um, by actually creating and coding uh, the website itself. So I'm not alone in thinking this. Um, I've done numerous studies have considered web developers to have the most responsibility and not. I've spoken to a lot of web developers who, who, who feel that themselves, but I'm aware that not every, not everyone um, feels that way. So just a just a question to throw out there. You know, do you, do you feel, do you agree? Um, who do you feel is, is, is most responsible for uh, web accessibility of all the stakeholders? Obviously, I'm most interested in, in web developers. Um, and I'm not alone in, in, in looking at this. And, and various authors have, have, have uh, suggested reasons for why websites are not accessible. Um, Lazar, Dudley, Bonogle, and Greenidge. Um, in 2004, proposed a, a web accessibility integration model, and it had the aim of uh, highlighting the various influences on the accessibility or inaccessibility of a website. And this provides uh, quite a useful framework from which to hang the various causes of poor accessibility. So it includes three sort of main strands. Uh, the first one is called societal foundations. And this just refers to education and training uh, in web accessibility, um, and also policy and law relating to web accessibility. Uh, and they also refer to the uh, the impact of shocking accessibility statistic statistics uh, upon web accessibility. Okay, so that's their their first uh, influence on web accessibility. The second sort of theme is stakeholder perceptions, as they call it, and that refers to the attitudes of, of the stakeholders and the people involved in developing a website. Um, and Lazar um, argues that if, if, neither, if none of the, the, the groups that are involved are aware or passionate about web accessibility, then the, the resulting website is unlikely to be accessible. And then the third kind of strand is uh, web development, and that refers to the direct influences upon um, web developers, such as guidelines and tools, which will affect uh, you know, the initial web design as well as ongoing management and, and, and redesign. So Lazar argues that the guidelines and tools um, not only provide guidance to web developers, but provide the current working definition of web accessibility. And they say, um, good, well-written guidelines and powerful 
software tools are likely to improve levels of accessibility. Poorly written, confusing guidelines and hard to use or unclear software tools uh, are, are likely to keep sites from becoming accessible. OK, so there is obviously a host of, of, of factors, host of influences uh, on uh, the accessibility of websites, education, law and policy, etc. Um, as I uh, 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 approach my PhD uh, research, um, there's, you know, there was little I, I could do about some of these broader um, uh, concerns. But the, the tools and the guidelines um, was something I could perhaps um, look at and, and do something about. So in my PhD, I've been investigating why web developers are struggling to make websites accessible and, and how we could improve uh, accessibility support to them. OK, so that was the, the, the background to the research. So here is what uh, I actually did. Um, so first, I uh, decided to go uh, back to basics, um, try and get a, a better understanding of, of web developers um, and why they're struggling you know, to create accessible websites. To do this, I used a technique called contextual inquiries, which you may be familiar with. Uh, it's not a million miles away from an interview, but it, it involves um, observing uh, interviewees conducting their own work in their own work environments, including a, a Starbucks uh, in this case. Um, so you sit with them, uh, they start doing their actual work, and then you start shadowing them and you're observing them and asking questions and taking notes and following them around and monitoring who they interact with, generally just being nosy, uh, really. Um, it, it sounds like it could be um, really irritating, really, but it's not, it's not in practice. Um, that wasn't for me. I didn't, I didn't think, didn't feel that way. Um, so I conducted contextual inquiries um, with 13 professional web developers from the uh, UK, uh, Ireland, and Italy. And they had a range of experience. Uh, some worked for large uh, enterprises, uh, some worked for um, small and medium enterprises. Uh, one participant was a, a self employed freelancer, and that was who I uh, met in the Starbucks which is where he was working. Um, so this study generated masses of data, um, who web developers interact with, uh, workplace cultures, the procedures they go through, even the layout of their desks and offices and the objects they use. Um, but I think really the takeaway message from this um, is that web developers do appear to be genuinely interested in making their websites accessible. Um, lack of awareness, lack of concern was not a problem. But it was a lack of knowledge uh, and a, a lack of practical guidance uh, that was, was a problem. And it was clear that the tools and guidelines they were using were letting them down and they were not providing them with the, the support and the information they need. So um, there were four key themes emerged as to why that was the case. And these related to um, language. So um, the existing tools and guidelines appeared vague and unspecific and very reliant upon um, domain-specific terminology. Um, and they assumed that web developers are familiar with accessibility jargon, such as um, what is sufficient color contrast, uh, what is a meaningful sequence, um, or provided, providing enough time, things like that. They're not clearly defined, not the sort of language they, they would choose to use. Um, another theme was the organization. So the existing tools and guidelines appeared quite abstract, quite arbitrary, and they were kind of unrelated to the people they were intended to benefit. So developers obviously focus more on the, the code and the techniques they need. But these tools and guidelines tend to be organized around um, accessibility-specific groupings uh, that were just unfamiliar to them. Uh, another theme um, was information overload. So these tools and guidelines presented an overwhelming amount of uh, accessibility information. Um, and they also um, presented a, a, a 
unreasonable, they, they call it unreasonable uh, number of items for web developers to test. Um, and the, you know, they acknowledged that a lot of uh, work was necessary um, to make accessible uh, websites, um, but it, it, as I say, they just found it a, a, an unreasonable amount to get through. So um, these various problems manifested in a lack of confidence about web accessibility. Um, there was an over-reliance upon automated tools which wanted to just get a pass, fail, just be told that's, that it is accessible. They didn't want that responsibility for making that judgment. And also an over-reliance upon accessibility experts. Handed it off to the to you know uh, accessibility experts, the sort of silos of, of expertise, and ultimately it led to the, the the avoidance of web accessibility, which is you know the biggest problem. So this this study gave me uh, a good understanding of the problems that the developers are facing in creating accessible websites, but they didn't they didn't really uh, explain their understanding of web accessibility and why these resources were so at odds with it. So, to explore this further, I um, conducted interviews with 26 developers from the UK and Italy. And again, they had a range of experience and worked for uh, different sized companies and freelancers. And I was particularly interested in what they understood about web accessibility and whether they have a, a sort of mental model of, of web accessibility and whether that, that mental model is it's accurate. Uh, you know. um, well, it turns out they, they do know a bit about accessibility, um, but not nearly enough. Um, they seem fairly clued up on the actual techniques uh, and the code necessary. Um, but that technical knowledge was based on a very limited foundation of knowledge about disabled people and assistive technologies and um, yeah, accessibility issues. Uh, the, the Not all, but the, the majority of participants in this study were mainly just aware of blind people uh, who use um, screen readers um, and the need to provide alternative text on images to support them. Fairly unsurprising really, this is sort of accessibility um, 101 uh, really. Um, but what was quite interesting was that they had, well the developers I spoke to appeared to have a very kind of development centric mental model of web accessibility. So they had a, a limited understanding of the actual users involved and how they actually use websites. Um, instead, they sort of thought in terms of the code they had to produce to support the assistive technologies uh, that disabled people use. So at least to the web developers I spoke to, a screen reader uh, or an alternative input device was almost like talked about like just under the user agent that they had to support, you know, like supporting Internet Explorer or something like that. So, so whereas dev developers seem to have this development-centric mental model, as we saw in the first study, the um, tools and guidelines and resources seem very accessibility-centric. Um, and they use this accessibility language and organization that's, that's just un unfamiliar to, to developers. Um, so just some examples there. Uh, in WCAG, provide users enough time to read and use content. Uh, make text content readable and understandable. Uh, help users avoid and correct mistakes. All quite reasonable uh, and true, um, but it's not immediately obvious to, to somebody what, what that actually means. And the, the bits they need, the coding techniques to address these issues, are, are kind of hidden away um, behind these rather vague accessibility centric statements. Okay. So it appears that web developers struggle to use access, uh, accessibility tools and guidelines because they approach web accessibility from a, a completely different perspective. Um, and this you know, explains why they find the guidelines and the tools quite vague and, and unspecific because they're not really making that connection between what they're doing and who they're, they're doing it for. So it just highlights the importance of a, a strong foundation of knowledge on which to, to sort of base accessibility guidance. Okay, so 
guidelines and tools and things need to address the misconceptions and correct the errors and, and fill in the, the knowledge gaps of web developers. But they need to do this while speaking their language and, and using terminology uh, that they're familiar with. Okay. Um, so to try and, and try and tackle this, I'm just gonna sweep. To try and tackle this, I uh, developed a, 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 a prototype of a, a different kind of accessibility resource um, called WebAir, Web uh, Accessibility Information Resource. Um, and WebAir is it's oriented to web developers' workflows and it's structured around different types of web content. So it's structured around forms and links, uh, tables, images, etc. Um, and each uh, category uh, is full of a list of concrete questions for web developers to follow. Um, for example, in the in the the links category, you've got something like, "Can you successfully access all the links using the keyboard?" Okay. And the language of WebAir uh, tries to avoid any accessibility jargon and try and use web development terms or or sort of user actions. Um, for each uh, question, there's a, a more information page that provides developers with a, a technical solution and um, also a code example uh, and, and further reading if, you know, if, re if required, links to further reading. Um, and to avoid um, overwhelming the developers with too many procedures. Each page contains you know, a much smaller uh, selection of techniques, which might not be as comprehensive in, in tackling uh, accessibility, but it kind of reduces that, that procedural overload. So it provides these techniques up front uh, and then gives them further information if required. Okay. Um, so there's a a screenshot of uh, a web air. Um, it's not the, not the prettiest, I'll admit. Um, but I needed to have a sort of uh, similar kind of t palette uh, to, to um, uh, the WCAG guidelines and W3C guidelines for, for later evaluation. So web air can be found at the following address. Um, HTTPS uh, colon slash slash www.cs york.ac.uk slash hci slash web air w-b-e-b-a-i-r okay um, and there's also a brief form on there um, for you to provide feedback which I, I'd, I'd be very grateful to as I say it's a, you know, it's a prototype um, resource so uh, feedback would be, would be gratefully received so um, in order to understand whether or not those various sort of design decisions actually improved access to uh, web accessibility information, um, I had to evaluate WebAir. The first um, evaluation was with 26 professional web developers and seven student web developers from Italy uh, and the UK. Again, a range of ex experience and different companies I worked for. And the student web developers were master students from the University of York. And um, in this, I gathered their impressions uh, of, of WebAir uh, and also of um, WCAG 2. Looking at the language and terminology and the structure and the organization and the, the amount of information and the number of items to test. Um, and I should take this op uh, opportunity to, to point out that WebAir is not intended to replace WCAG in any way. Um, it, couldn't, it couldn't do that. It's a very different kind of thing. And you know, I'm not taking anything away from uh, all the you know the work of of, of, of way uh, at all. But I think of WebAir as a sort of complement to existing web accessibility resources for sort of training and educating web developers, um, particularly those who are new to web accessibility. Um, so. I'm pleased to say um, that participants were generally very positive about WebAir and rated it very highly. Um, they found the language of WebAir um, very understandable, although some found it a little too basic uh, and more appropriate for a, a general audience. So it's a, quite a tricky balance to get there. Uh, they found the organization you know, made sense and was easy to navigate, 
but they struggle with some, particularly in the early version, some of the initial categories that we had, like we had um, one called within page and one called between page and multimedia. Particularly in multimedia, a few people complained about that. Somebody said it was a very dated term. Um, uh, they said it was um, reminiscent of 90 CD-ROMs. Anyway, uh, they found the amount of information in WebAir was about right, not too off-putting. Um, and they liked the option of exploring topics in greater depth uh, if they had the time or you know the inclination. Um, with regards to the the number of items to test. Um, Though WebAir is much smaller than WCAG, they still found it quite a lot to get through. And the problem seemed to be that they were saving the accessibility testing up till the very end of development. Um, so it makes it seem a very daunting task. It's still the last, you know, long uh, list of things to do. So all in all, it was quite a positive start. But um, I wanted to know whether it was actually any use for, for finding accessibility problems. Um, so, in that previous study, uh, the web developers provided a lot of feedback about WebAir, and I made some adjustments and rewrote a lot of the content and renamed the categories and, and, and tried to you know, simplify it and, and, and reduce the size of it where I could. Um, and then I did a, a lab-based evaluation with uh, 48 student web developers, and they used um, both WCAG and WebAir to uh, find problems in two live websites. That, that's those of um, Manchester United Football Club and the pure pure gym chain of, of gyms and health clubs. Uh, don't ask me why I picked those websites. I'm neither a, a football fan uh, nor a, a, a gym enthusiast, but they, yeah, they had a lot of problems uh, in them. So, um, so again, um, participants were very positive about WebAir uh, and they, they, yeah, they rated it very highly. Um, but the, the type of resource, WebAir or WCAG, made no difference to the number of problems that the participants found or how confident they were about them. So it wasn't a stunning result. Uh, on reflection, there might have been a few limitations um, to that study. It was, it was lab-based, so it was quite artificial. Uh, they used these live websites, so they were very difficult to control. In fact, the, the Manchester United website changed uh, on, on the day of testing, which was really helpful. Um, it used students who weren't particularly motivated and to take part. Um, there was no real incentive for them other than learning about uh, web accessibility. And they also only had 25 minutes with each resource, which for student web developers wasn't really enough for them to get familiar with things, let alone you know, find many problems. So I'm not making ex excuses, but it, there were quite a few sort of limitations to that study. So, um, I got, I got real with it, um, and I tried to conduct a more real-world uh, evaluation uh, with 32 professional web developers from Australia, uh, the Netherlands, and the UK. Um, and I did these evaluations in people's workplaces and cafes and, and pubs, and, and some I did um, remotely uh, via Skype. Uh, so they used their own computer and their own setup, and the hope was it provide a more realistic, more natural environment. Um, and another difference in this was I, I built the, the experimental website myself. Um, so I had better controls over the, the problems that it contained. And I apologize to anybody watching this who, who took part in the study. The, the, uh, the website had a very annoying um, auto-playing audio of a crowd cheering um, when it loaded. So I, I don't want to bring on any, any flashbacks to that. Um, the... Um, Oh, participants also had a bit longer um, to do the evaluations at 35 minutes, which still is not ideal, but slightly more acceptable. Um, and the results of that, um, again, rated WebAir um, very positively, and they found significantly more problems using um, WebAir uh, than using uh, WCAG. So it's a promising result, and it suggests those design decisions in WebAir uh, are having an effect. Um, so I, I noticed one peculiarity with WebAir. Um, by making the language more familiar, some web developers looked at the initial question on the, the index page and, and sort of incorrectly assumed that they knew what it was about and didn't bother reading any more information about it. And then that led to the missing problems that they could have easily detected. So 
that's just something I'll be aware of uh, in, in the future. So it's almost like making the resource too familiar kind of resulted in a false confidence. I'm not, I'm not really sure what was causing that. Anyway, so on to my final study. Um, WebAir, the, the, the design decisions in WebAir seem to be effective in helping uh, web developers identify problems in existing websites, but I was also interested in how uh, effective they were for helping web developers actually create uh, accessible websites. I didn't want it to be a, uh, a resource for web, de web developers to use at the very end of the, the development cycle. I wanted them to you know, use it throughout. Um, so to uh, evaluate WebAir in a more natural setting, I conducted a, a field study evaluation as such uh, with 15 web developers from the UK uh, and Australia. And um, I asked web developers um, to use WebAir um, over a two week period to create an accessible website. And I gave them all the content and provided a, a sort of realistic spec for them to follow. Um, and I also asked them to keep an uh, online diary during this time of their experiences. Now I'm afraid I haven't got a lot to say about this one um, as I'm still, still analysing this. Um, but again, um, the results suggest that those design decisions have been have been received very positively by the web develop, web developers. Um, it received you know some high ratings, um, and um, the websites they've built are on the whole uh, accessible. So it suggests the design decisions are effective both in evaluating and creating accessible websites, which is good. Um, sort of glancing over the the diary feedback, common things that they raised were. They wanted more examples of best practice, um, more visual uh, examples, more interactivity, similar to how W3 schools do it, you know, with um, uh, a WYSIWYG kind of interface and change the code and show you what's happened on the other side. Um, some still feel that WebAir focuses too much on accessibility basics and they'd like to know an idea of um, how to focus more on the, the, the trickier aspects of web development, which is a, it's a tricky balance of, of where to pitch it, really. Um, and lots of web developers have suggested some means of prioritizing the information, again, suggesting that they feel it's still too much. Um, some suggested prioritizing it by job role um, or, or, or importance, like, like how Workout does with the priority levels. Uh, and um, uh, unfortunately, Web developers, uh, web apps, sorry, still seen as as a as a, a lot to do. Um, but I, I think that's because, as I say, web developers are still thinking of it as something to do at the end of the project rather than uh, integrating it earlier. Okay. So, um, just to uh, summarise. Um, that's just a, a sort of a whistle stop overview of my research into why web developers are, are struggling uh, to create accessible websites and what might be done to support them. Um, despite many initiatives to improve web accessibility over the last 15 years, studies have suggested that the, the accessibility of websites is barely improving and in some cases is, is, is getting worse. Uh, there are various stakeholders involved in creating accessible websites, but, but most responsible is, is the web developer, I feel. And there's various factors that influence them, but the one that has the most impact uh, is um, appears to be uh, the tools and the guidelines. Uh, and there's several reasons why developers uh, struggle with um, tools and guidelines related to language and organisation and, and, and the amount of information and the the number of things to test. Um, and these tools and guidelines appear to be at odds with web developers' sort of understanding and mental models of, of web accessibility. Then you get a lack of confidence about web accessibility, an over-reliance upon tools and experts, and ultimately the, the, the avoidance of web accessibility. So WebAir is an attempt to try and address this by presenting support material and techniques in, in web development oriented language uh, and organized around the work uh, practices of, of web developers. So it's, it's uh, been designed with developers in mind. Uh, and the various evaluations of this resource so far suggest that the design decisions 
have been effective, um, both in supporting web developers to uh, evaluate and create accessible websites. Um, but there's one sort of caveat I need to raise. Um, so the difficulties that, that the web developers encounter are only one part of the problem. And as my research has, has developed, I've, I've come to realize that um, you know, we, we need to focus on more than just web developers. You know, there needs to be a, more of an organizational shift towards web accessibility that involve, involves all those stakeholders and everyone uh, responsible uh, for creating um, accessible websites. And similarly, the, uh, the support that may be provided by guidelines and tools uh, and information, um, they're just one part of the solution. So it's important we don't become too checklist focused and too uh, reliant upon these resources at the expense of uh, you know, acknowledging the actual experience of, of, of people with disabilities. Okay, so that is uh, pretty much all for me. Um, if you've got any, uh, any, any feedback either on what I've presented today or on WebAir, um, and please get in touch. Um, my uh, uh, web address is davidswallow.co.uk. You can find me on Twitter as um, David of York. And as I mentioned earlier, WebAir can be found online at uh, www.cs.york.ac. Dot uk slash hci slash web air okay um, and as I said there's a, there's a feedback form um, for you to provide any feedback which I'm very grateful for and there's also a paper out there that provides more detail about the, the sort of development and evaluation of of web air so thank you very much any questions? Okay, uh, thank you very much. That's really good. Um, let's see, we've got some, well, at least one question I've seen. Um, have you, over time, noticed a positive shift in attitude of developers towards accessibility? If so, why do you think this is? Mm. Um, I th there definitely has been, yes. Um, not just from my work, from the studies uh, before that. Um, there have been quite a few um, sort of in-depth studies of web developers, and one notable trend is that there's been a greater awareness of web accessibility, not necessarily borne out in what in what they do, but you know that, that developers are much more aware of of web accessibility and of uh, the guidelines and and WCAG and, and 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 legal requirements and things like that. So so yes, I think there there definitely has been a, a trend that way. Um, and over the time I've done my research, I've, I've certainly seen that, uh, you know, and, and towards the end, the later studies, developers are much more uh, clued up and aware of web accessibility than at the start. So um, even if, if resources and things are not, I don't know, a positive effect on, on web accessibility, they're definitely having an impact on, on awareness, which, is, you know, is a very good start. So. Yes. As for, for why, um, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, it it, it feels like a, um, there is more general awareness. And it's talked about more, and, and the and the guidelines and resources of the W3C and things like that are are, are um, you know, there's more advertising of that, and they seem more popular. So I don't know if that's had had an effect. Just a general awareness, and it seems to have sort of broken through more into. Um, Web development and and um, user experience circles and a lot more awareness there. So yes, it definitely has, but I'm, I'm I'm not sure exactly what's contributed to that. Just answer the question. Okay. Um, another question we've got kind of uh, it internally is uh, let me find it. Sorry, I should have found it before it. Started it is what what in terms of the the, the, the questions uh, that you asked. I mean, what sort of 
uh, questions were you asking of, of the developers throughout each phase? I mean, did you have a particular list of questions that you asked, or was it more kind of like a sort of conversation um, in terms was, of the questions? Yeah, it was a bit of both, really. Um, I'll find the list here, actually. I, I, didn't, I didn't actually go into too much detail with that, did I? Um, the... They, I asked them, was a, most of it was an open-ended um, interview and a discussion through, um, through you know, the resources. And I also had a, a rating scale. I can't find my um, list. Oh, yeah, there we go. So I was interested in uh, usefulness, um, ease of use, um, navigability, uh, and how, they, you know, how easily they can get around the resource. Um, Understandability of the resource, the the clarity of the the organisation of it, um, uh, the completeness of the resource, um, the amount of information it provided, uh, and also the number of items to test. Um, oh, and their, their confidence in using it and, 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 and the confidence in the information information it provided, and also their likelihood of using it in future, you know, whether they felt they could see themselves using that. So those were the kind of themes, um, both of the questions I asked uh, and the ratings um, that they asked for. Yeah. So yeah, it's quite a varied spread. But a lot of the information came out of a more free-flowing interview, really. If that answers that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, I don't think there was any other questions on Twitter. Ian, do you have any questions for um, for for David here? I'll just check uh, Twitter again, see if there's anything there. Um, no, I think that's it. So good job. Okay. <laughs> very interesting presentation. Thanks very much for that, David. That was that was really good to hear. Um, so I think that's. It for now. The next presentation is at is on the hour at uh, eleven o'clock UK time. Um, so we'll see you there shortly. And thank you once again to to David Swallow for his very interesting presentation there. So I will close off the the the, um, uh, the broadcast just now. David, have you got any final things you would like to get across or? Um, no. Um, th thank you for listening. Uh, and as I say, if you've got any feedback, please. Please have a look at where we're at and please um, give me that feedback. That would, that would be, that would be well, uh, well received. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Um, now, Ian, I just click stop broadcast here. That's right. Okay. Thank you, everybody.